Welcome to NPTEL NOC course on point set topology part 2. This is module 1, the chapter 1 on differential calculus on Banach spaces. In this introductory chapter, we shall present statements and proofs of implicit function theorem and inverse function theorem in differential calculus. Since we have developed enough background on Banach spaces in part one, we plan to do this directly for Banach spaces rather than for R. Usually for Rn, one can prove inverse function theorem and then prove implicit function theorem, which becomes a little more transparent. In the case of Banach spaces, such a you know, method is not possible. We have to first prove the implicit function theorem and then deduce inverse function theorem. One of the key factors which needs to be sharpened in the case of Banach spaces is the so-called weak mean value theorem. In the case of you know Rn, because it has a rich structure, namely Hilbert space structure, the proof is much simpler. Here the proof is a little more deeper analysis involving what are called as Dini derivatives. Okay. If you have some difficulty in understanding Banach spaces, you can just, you know, replace all words Banach spaces by Rn and just think of Rn and try to follow the the material. Afterwards, you can fill in your Banach spaces once you learn Banach spaces thoroughly. Let me recall these notations which I have already introduced to you. These notations will not be used for any other thing during this course. So they are kind of frozen, especially these are all standard ones, of course. These Euler fonts R, C, Q, Z, N. In addition, I will be also using that. This Euler font I for closed interval 0, 1, DN for the closed unit disk, SN for unit sphere. PN and CPN come very rarely, but I have also in a standard notation, I don't use it for any other thing. Sometimes I need the open interval minus one to plus one raised to n, for which I will use this jn. Most important one is often I have to deal with both real and complex fields simultaneously. So, in that case, I will use this notation k. The context, if there is a special case, then we will mention it. Otherwise, this k will be either or real numbers or complex numbers. Okay. So, let me begin with a modification of the contraction mapping theorem that we have proved in part one. The modification is an extension actually. There we had proved it for one map. Here we will prove it for a family of maps. That is the importance. So start with a metric space XD. A Y be any topological space. Take a function on Y cross X to X, which is continuous. Okay. So that there is a real number between 0 and 1, strictly between 0 and 1, such that this property, a distance property holds, the distance between f of yx1 and f of yx2 
is less than or equal to c times the transform x1 and x2 for all y and for all x1 and x2 inside x. So this is some kind of uh, Lipschitz condition, uniform Lipschitz condition. Okay. If this condition holds, then we have a conclusion. What is the conclusion? For each y inside y, there exists a unique phi y inside x, such that f of y phi y is y. Okay. You can think of f of y x is x because phi y is a point of that. That x, unique x, will be called as phi y because it's a unique one. So thus we get a assignment from y to x, a function phi y. This phi y has the property the distance between phi y2 and phi y1 is less than or equal to 1 divided by 1 minus c. That's the same c here. Distance between phi y2 and f of y1 phi y2. So this is a technical result that will be very helpful. In particular, you can immediately see that P is continuous because of this one. Okay. So you have this distance between y1 and y2, P of, P of y1 and y2 is dominated by this one. So if y1 and y2 can be controlled, then this can be controlled. Therefore, this resultant side can be controlled is the conclusion here. If you forget about this capital Y here, just take one single function. Okay, then we have proved this statement here. Then there is no function here. It's only one. So there is only part A, namely there is a unique function, a unique thing, and that is a contraction mapping. So the addition here is when you have a family of functions which satisfies this uniform Lipschitz condition, we get a continuous function out of it. It's stronger than saying just continuous. So that that oh, that uh, property we have put here, we will use this one uh, once again. Okay. So let us go through the proof of this one. All right. First of all, let us recall the proof in the case of when there is a single function. For each y inside y, let us look at fy, one single function, x to x, given by fy of x is equal to f of y x. The y coordinate is fixed, so you get one single function. Okay. For this, let us say what, what is the proof of this theorem, what we have done already. Okay that if y is a singleton, then this theorem is nothing but the ordinary contraction mapping principle. So let us recall the proof. For simplicity, we shall use the same notation f for the function f restricted to y, namely fy, in this special case. Okay, this singleton y. Okay, so in this special case. Let us first prove the uniqueness. Let x1 and x2 be two points such that fx1 equal to x1 and f of x2 equal to x2. Okay. Then distance between x1 and x2 will be distance between fx1 and fx2 because x1 is fx1, x2 is fx2. But this is less than c times distance between x1 and x2. Now y is suppressed here, that's all fx1 distance to fx1, fx2 is less than two distance between fx1 and x2. So this is condition 1, right? So condition 1 will tell you that we have distance between x1 and x2 is less than or equal to a fraction of the same distance. And this is possible only if this, this real number is 0. Okay, that means x1 is equal to x2. This is the way the uniqueness part was proved and we have just recalled it. For the existence part, what we do? We follow the iteration method, right? Start with any point x, inductively define 
x2 equal to f of x1, x3 equal to f of x2 and so on, xn equal to f of xn minus 1, which is nothing but f, f, f operative 1 f, etc. n minus 1 times x1, f power n minus 1 times x1. Okay. We claim that the sequence got by iterating the powers of f on x1, namely xn, is a Cauchy sequence. Okay, and then we will appeal to that the metric space is complete to get a limit. Okay, that limit if I denote by x, then we will show that this x is the fixed point, fx is equal to x. Okay, so how does one prove that this is a Cauchy sequence? Let us, for the sake of simplicity, put r equal to distance between x1 and x2. What is x2? It is f of x1. If f of x1 is already x1, then this distance will be 0, right? But we have already solved this problem. We don't have to go any further. Never mind. So r may be 0, never mind. But whatever we have, if r is not 0, namely f of x1 is not equal to x1, then only we have to iterate, right? So we keep iterating. So don't worry about right now whether it's equal to if it's equal to by chance if you know that you get we can stop there is no problem then d of x2 x1 x2 x3 will be d of x2 is fx1 and x3 is fx2 that is let's go c times distance between x1 and x2 which is less than c times r okay now you repeat this one d of x3 x4 will be c square times r and so on distance between xn and xn plus 1 will be less than or equal to c power n minus 1 times r okay therefore one more suppose suppose we assume this one we have to if repeat it you will get distance between xn plus 1 xn plus 2 c power n times r so same formula is there now Therefore, distance between any xn and xn plus m now, I use triangle inequality m times, right? So I go for xn to xn plus 1, xn plus 1 to xn plus 2, xn plus 2 to xn plus 3, take all these distances, add them up, put a less than or equal to 0 to m minus 1 distance between x n plus i and x n plus i plus 1. Okay. But just now we have proved this formula. This distance is r times c power n plus i minus 1. Okay. X, x n, c n minus 1 comes. So x n plus i will be c n plus i minus 1. Which is the same thing as r comes out i range from n minus 1 to n plus m minus 1 c power i. What are these? These are nothing but partial sums of the series 1 plus c plus c square plus c cube, which is a geometric series, where c is between 0 and 1. Therefore, this itself is a, you know, Geometry series is a partial sum of quasi sequences. So now summation C is a geometric series which converges to 1 divided by 1 minus C. So that explains why we have got this 1 divided by 1 minus C here in this inequality. Okay. So continuing with the proof of this quasi sequence, in particular, the Partial sums i range to 1 to n c i. This is a Cauchy sequence. So subtract the n first n terms, namely uh, the summation up to n term. In n plus m term, what you have is this one. This can be made less than epsilon, given any epsilon, choosing n and m properly. Therefore, this is a Cauchy sequence. Okay, so what we have proved is Xn is a Cauchy sequence. It converges because x is complete matrix space. 
After that, if you apply limit of xn, it's the same thing as limit of xn plus 1, it's the same thing as limit of f of xn plus 1, f is a continuous function. So you can take out f, so it will be equal to f of limit of xn, which is equal to f of x, which is equal to x. Okay. So f of x is limit of f of xn is also limit of xn plus 1 because f of xn can be written, but this limit is same thing as f. All right. So now if you take m tending to infinity in this summation, distance to xn and x infinity is what now? It is x. Okay. What is this sum summation? What you get is distance between xn and x is less than or equal to r times c power n minus 1 divided by 1 minus c. The partial sums from the, this is the remainder after n term. Okay. So, for n greater than or equal to 1, this is always true. All right. So, now we will do the same copy, just copying put the variable y also, okay. The idea of the proof is exactly same, there is no, no change at all, okay. Returning to general case, since the fixed point x depends upon the function f y, right, we are changing y, for each y, I will get a different fixed point, I will go on to f phi y, so that is the notation. Also. This r which we have fixed as the first distance between x1 and x2, okay. So, this will now depend upon y because this is now the distance between here. So, you come here, distance between xn and f of yx1. So, y is coming here. So, let us denote this r by, let us replace it by this term. I can write the ry or something if you want, no problem. We can then rewrite this 3 as distance between, you see, this now xn is fn, fy of x, fy of n minus 1 times x1, phi y, phi y is the, the, the limit point here, the fixed point here. It's less than equal to distance between x1, this r is f of y x1, this, this distance c power n minus 1 by 1 minus c, this is always, this is independent of y, there is the, the constant c is independent of y, remember that. For every n greater than equal to 1, y in x, x1 in x4. So, this is the inequality which you have, okay. So, now given y1 and y2, put n equal to 1, this is valid for all n, n equal to 1 y equal to y1, x1 equal to phi y2, okay, is the above inequality to get this is n equal to 1, so this will be g of phi y2 phi y1, okay. So I am taking n equal to 1, y equal to y1 and x1 equal to phi y2, this x1 phi y2, m power n, n is 1, so there is no uh, operation here, starting point, okay. So, this will become phi y2 phi y1 because x1 is phi y2 is less than or equal to 1 by 1 minus c times the right hand side is distance between x1 and f of y x1 which is phi y2 into f of y1 phi y2. So, this is what we wanted to prove. This was conclusion of the part of theorem. Note that in this notation, f of y2 phi y2 is phi y2, okay, f of y1 phi y1 phi y1 and so on, whatever f of y phi y is phi y. But continuity of f given epsilon positive, we can choose a neighborhood n1 cross n2 of this point y2 phi y2 in y cross x such that distance between phi y2 and any f of y x is less than epsilon times 1 minus c 
for all y and x inside n1 cross n2. Just continuity of y uh, of f from y cross x to x. Take a point here, it's going to phi y2, and then you can find a neighborhood of this one. That is epsilon neighborhood because it is a metric space. In the domain, you have y, which is an arbitrary space. And x, of course, is a metric space. So I am writing the neighborhood as n1 cross n2 instead of choosing ball neighborhoods and so on. Of the point y2, f phi y2. Okay, this is inside y cross x. This entire neighborhood, f of this, goes inside this epsilon neighborhood. So I am making epsilon into 1 minus c times that neighborhood instead of this. So this is... You can choose epsilon prime here and then write epsilon prime is 1 minus no problem. The distance between phi y2 and any f of yx, as soon as y and x are inside this neighborhood, is less than this one. So this is continuity of f. Therefore, now using the continuity of f put here, y1 inside n1, it follows that distance between phi y2 and phi y1 is 1 divided by 1 minus c times instead of this i can write 1 divided by 1 minus c times this one is, is, is c epsilon times 1 minus c but 1 minus c cancels out you are left with epsilon just to cancel out 1 minus c i put 1 minus c here that's why okay so this is last part is to derive the continuity of the function phi we have obtained okay as a solution as a fixed point all right so i am repeating condition one may be referred to as uniform contraction mapping condition why because the left hand side here the right hand side here the choice of c does not depend upon uh, y at all for all y you have this one that is why i told you that this is like uniform lipsis right so the theorem itself can be called as uniform contraction mapping any questions let us uh, recall a few basic facts from nonlinear spaces and banach spaces and so on suppose you have two normed in a spaces and t from v to w is a linear map then the following conditions are equivalent remember on a infinite dimensional lean, uh, infinite dimensional vector space a linear map may not be continuous so therefore these things become non vacuous statements okay T is continuous at 0, there exists lambda positive such that norm of Tx is less than to lambda times norm of x for all x inside V. T is continuous uniformly on the whole of V. Okay, so all these three are equivalent conditions. None of them may be <laughs> true in general. When t is, when v is finite dimensional, this will be automatically true. Okay, for all linear functions. Okay, so let me just uh, recall this because this is so fundamental. Okay, one implies two. That means once we assume continuity at one single point zero. Okay, by the way, you can assume continuity at any other point also. It is equal to that one. I could have put that condition also here. You can think about it. Take it as an exercise. So, put epsilon equal to 1. By continuity of t at 0, we get a delta positive such that norm of x less than equal to delta implies norm of t x is less than equal to 1. Epsilon, so I have put epsilon 1. Therefore, now you take x to be any non zero vector, 
okay then norm of tx is equal to norm of x divided by delta i am writing delta divided by norm of x times x here t of that and then I have to compensate for this factor, which comes out and cancels out with this one. So this, all this entire thing is just norm of Tx. Delta divided by norm of x has been multiplied inside here. The same thing inverse is multiplied outside here. Okay. But what is the idea of this one? Now, if norm of x is less than or equal to delta, okay. Then what is the norm of this inside thing bracket here? It is less than or equal to delta because x by norm x is going the way this one. The delta times that is less than or equal to delta. Okay. So I can apply this inequality. It means that this part is less than or equal to 1. So there is norm of x by delta here. So less than or equal to norm of x by delta. So for all x not equal to 0, norm of tx is less than the norm of x by delta. It's x is 0, left hand side is 0, right hand side is also 0, so inequality is valid. Okay, so for all x this is true actually. But for writing down this proof, I have to assume x is not 0, that's all. Because I have divided it by norm x here. So we can take lambda equal to 1 by delta, then what do I get? I will norm of Tx is less than to lambda times norm of x. So that is the conclusion of 2. Okay. As soon as you have such a uniform lambda, uniform continuity follows. Right? On the whole of T of x1 minus x2 will be less than equal to lambda times norm of x1 minus x2. Right? So if norm of x1 minus x2 is less than or equal to some epsilon, whatever delta you want, you have to choose this appropriately by dividing out by this lambda. That's all. Okay. So 2 implies 3 is obvious in that way. But 3 implies 1 is obvious because this is now actually continuous on the whole of V, so it continues to 0 also. Okay. Now we make a definition here. Take V and W to be any two norm linear spaces. Take a linear map from V to W and we will call it bounded or a continuous linear map if there exists lambda positive such that norm of Tx is less than to lambda times norm of x for every x belonging to belonging to V. Okay. So, such a thing is called bounded linear map. This is the standard terminology in function and analysis. I can't help it. It is not the standard meaning of you know, bounded functions. Functions which taking values in a metric space, bounded function has a different meaning altogether. This is a bit unfortunate terminology. But uh, you will get used to it when you are doing function analysis. The longer term is continuous linear map. That's all. It's not too long. If you bounded linear map, you have to say. Instead of that, it's a continuous linear map, you can say. Okay. For a bounded linear map, f from v to w, there is something called the operator norm. Okay, we have introduced this one in the in part one also. We have in, in, in fact uh, studied the Banach space of continuous functions on a metric space and so on. So I'm just recalling it. The operator norm, norm t is defined as supremum of all norm t, norm t of x, where norm of x is one. That means x is varying on the unit sphere in the domain. Okay, domain is V. So norm of x, x must be inside V of course here. We shall denote the space of all bounded linear maps from T to 
t from v to w by this curly b v w. You will just read it as b v w. This is clearly a vector space. Okay. What do you have to do? You have to show that if f and g are bounded, of course, linearity is clear. f plus g is also bounded linear. Alpha times f is also bounded linear. That's all. So together with the operator norm, as we have defined here, it becomes a normed linear space. This norm has the standard properties that norm t is always not, not you know, is bigger than or equal to zero. If it is zero, if and only if t is identically zero, and alpha times norm t is mod alpha times norm t. Okay, norm of sorry, norm of alpha times t is mod alpha times norm of t, and the triangle inequality in terms of addition, norm of t plus s is less than or equal to norm t plus norm s. So these are the conditions which make a function norm. Okay. The following result about operator norm, namely this special thing I want to, not general norm as such, are all very easy to derive. So what are these? I have summed it up in this lemma. We will keep using this again and again. So let us go through it carefully that you understand this one completely. Take vector spaces, okay, v1, v2, v3, they are all normed linear spaces. I am not going to mention different norms are here. I am not going to mention that. This is standard practice, just like we keep saying x1 is a topological space without mentioning the topology there, right? So, v1, v2, v3, etc. denote norm linear space. Take a bounded linear map from v1 to v2, another from v2 to v3. Okay. Now, I am defining an operation LT on b1, b, v1, v2. Okay. LT of S is decomposite S. You can view it as from the operation from this side, namely opera operating via S on T. So you can think of this RS of T. What is this? S LT of S is composing T on the left. RS of T is composing with S on the right. Okay. So if you vary S, this will be a map from B, V1, V2 to B, V1, V3. If you vary T, namely keep S as it is, then it will be a map from B, what? Very T I am varying now. Okay. B, V2, V3 to B, V1, V3. Okay. So this is the interesting thing that I am, I am interested in, namely left multiplication or right multiplication, you can say. Obviously, these functional compositions are non-commutative. So that is why you have to worry about this, whether right composition or left composition separately. In any case, the first thing is very simple. Norm of T composite S is less than or equal to norm T into norm S. This is a very fundamental property which makes the norm linear space into what is called as normed algebras. Okay. Now, LT is again a bounded linear map from B1 V2 to B V1 V3. Similarly, RT is the bounded linear map from V2, V3 to B, V1, V3. Okay. They are linear maps. They are bounded linear maps because of you keep using this one. Equation, inequation one. This inequality one will tell you that. Now, you vary T itself. 
okay for each t you have a boundary linear map so l itself from b v2 v3 to b of b of this okay similarly r from b v1 v2 to the bounded linear maps from the bounded linear maps to bounded linear maps. So they are themselves continuous continuity is what i wanted to emphasize all of them follow from this one single inequation here the linearity is obvious for all of them okay if you add your s1 plus s2 here that will be t composite s1 plus t composite s2 or if you add t1 plus t2 here rs of t1 plus t2 is rs of t1 plus rs of t2 so linearity etc is not a problem continuity follows from just this one okay indeed you can talk about the 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 operator norm of lt and operator norm of l and operator norm of r and find out all these things is easy exercise very easy do that so that you definitely understand these things completely okay so i will have one more uh, important lemma here namely now i am assuming it's a w is a banach space okay the banach space is nothing but a norm linear space in which the induced matrix is complete every cauchy sequence is convergent right so take b as this uh, codomain as a banach space then the set of all bounded linear functions from v to w with the operator norm becomes a banach space itself this is what we have studied last time in the part 1 okay let t belong to b v now b v is a short notation for b v comma v when v and w are same instead of writing b v v i am just writing b v so these are self self maps from v to v linear maps okay linear operators bounded linear operators if t is an element of that where v itself is a banach space such that norm t is less than 1 then identity minus t or you can take identity plus t also which is same thing because i can change t to minus t is invertible with the inverse given by the convergent series identity minus t inverse what is that it is given by summation 0 to infinity t power n the geometric series one one is identity plus t plus t square plus t cube and so on okay why this is convergent because the partial sums they are bounded by one plus you know this is a norm t norm t let's call it as c one plus c plus c square and so on this norm t summation that becomes a geometric series so that is the proof okay all right so if you look at identity map that is invertible you can take a bound you can take a ball of radius less than 1 actually equal to 1 okay the open ball if you take all the elements in that are invertible so this is the hypothesis this is the conclusion here okay in any banach space okay the unit ball centered around the identity okay represents all invertible elements okay there may be more invertible elements of course but this is definitely 
uh, all these are invertible elements. This is the meaning of this. All right. So here are some elementary exercises. Other than working out whatever I told you, some of this without proof and so on. So that is the first the lesson you have to do. Okay. So let me just read out this. Show that formula 6 defines a norm on BVW. I'm just given the norm. You have to show, you have to verify those three conditions. Prove that 1.5 and 1.6, these lemmas in 0.6, and this one. This is what you have to do. So that is the exercise for you. Thank you. We will meet next time.